Here, if you try to cut it, you're also cutting a lot of links to an area that's useful. And uh, so you run quite a serious risk by so doing. Um, so in particular, if mathematicians work on difficult practical problems, they do not do so in isolation from the rest of mathematics. Rather, they bring to the problem several tools, mathematical tricks, rules of thumb, theorems known to be useful in the mathematical sense, and so on. They do not know in advance which of these tools they will use, but they hope that after they have thought hard about a problem, they will realize what is needed to solve it. If they are lucky, they can simply apply their existing expertise straightforwardly. More often, they will have to adapt it to some extent. Perhaps it will be helpful if I show another two pictures, this time explaining in, in a very vague way what it is like to solve a mathematical problem. So again, I'll start with a naive picture of what it's like to solve a mathematical problem, and then I'll give one that's a bit more realistic, but still an oversimplification. But that might be the naive view. You start with a certain amount of knowledge, you think for a while, you have a brainwave, you haven't solved it, so you think a bit longer, you have another brainwave. You still haven't solved it, so you have another brainwave. You're doing quite well if you have three brainwaves, actually. <laughs> and then you think for another while, and you've solved it. And that's the, that's the whole picture. Well, <laughs> any mathematician will recognize that that is not quite what it feels like. Uh, so again, I stress that the next picture is also a huge oversimplification, but it's just less of an oversimplification than the one I've had before. So it'd be more like this. You start with some existing knowledge, which I've written in blue down at the bottom. And uh, you're not quite sure what's going to be useful. It turns out that this one bit here, and that bit there, that bit there, were useful. Um, these green nodes here denote sort of dead ends, ideas that were had. Somebody attempted to solve it by following with this sort of green path here, but it didn't work. Um, and in the end, eventually, they found this sort of red thing that led to the final proof of the theorem. And so it's important that you've got a whole lot of parts here that you don't use, as well as a whole lot of parts that you do use. That's the real point that I want to stress. Uh, so a good way to think about mathematics as a whole is that it is a huge body of knowledge, a bit like an encyclopedia, but with the important difference that it has an enormous number of cross-references. This knowledge is stored in books, papers, and the brains of thousands of mathematicians around the world. It is not as convenient to look up a piece of mathematics as it is to look up a word in an encyclopedia, especially as it is not always easy to specify exactly what it is that one wants to look up. Nevertheless, this so-called encyclopedia of mathematics is an incredible resource. And just as if one were to try to get rid of all the entries in an encyclopedia or all the books in a library that nobody ever looked up, the result would be a greatly impoverished encyclopedia or library. So any attempt to purge mathematics of its less useful parts would almost certainly be very damaging to the more useful parts as well. So far, I have simply stated that mathematics is full of surprising connections. Any mathematician will happily confirm that statement and be able to give examples from his or her experience. Indeed, discovering surprising connections is one of the great joys of the subject. I would like to illustrate the interconnectedness of mathematics with an example in which I've played a small part. I just want to describe um, three or four problems. I shall describe them rather briefly. So um, that is because my purpose, my main purpose, is not so much to go into great mathematical detail about the problems. It's just to convey somehow the flavor of the problems. And then I'll say why I want to convey the flavor of them. So let's look at these sequences of numbers, 5, 11, 17, 23, 29, and then and there's some other ones. Um, if you look at it, you'll notice that the jump from 5 to 11 is 6, and it jumps up by another 6 to 17, by another 6 to 23, and so on. So this uh, sort of sequence where you jump by a regular amount is called an arithmetic progression. Here's another one, 7, 19, 31, 43. The jump is 12, and here the jump is 30, 11, 41, 71, 101, 131, and similarly for the bottom one. Now, you might ask why I didn't continue those sequences further. Well, the reason was that all these numbers in black here have in common they are prime numbers, something of great interest to mathematicians. And had I tried to continue from 29, say I'd have gone to 35, and that's not a prime number because it's 5 times 7. And over here also are the explanations for why the next number is not a prime number. 
Now, once I show you that, there are some very obvious questions you could ask. The most obvious one is the second one, actually. Is there any limit to the possible size of an arithmetic progression consisting solely of prime numbers? Nobody knows the answer. I think the record that anyone's found is about 22 or 23, but that's just discovered by a computer search. It doesn't really get you any closer to a solution of the problem. Another question is, are there infinitely many arithmetic progressions consisting of four prime numbers? So I'll just leave that problem there. I could spend an hour talking about it happily, or more, but... Uh, Problem number two, consider those numbers at the top, 3, 5, 8, 13, 14, and so on. What have I drawn these lines for? Well, notice that 5 minus 3 is 2, and that's the same as 29 minus 27. So I've picked out quadruples of these numbers, so it's like 3, 5, 27, 29, where the difference of two of them is the same as the difference of another two. So another example, 14 take away 8, that's the green example, is the same as 35 take away 29. They're both 6. So I'll just leave that there. Now here's something else. If I take a set of numbers 1, 2, 4, 6, 23, 29, and call that A, what I mean by A plus A is the set of all numbers that I can make out of A by adding two things in A. So for example, 4 plus 6 is 10, and that's why I've written 10 over here. 23 plus 29 is 52. That's why 52 appears here. I've written down all the things I can make by adding two of those. Quite an interesting problem in certain contexts is how large the set is of numbers that you can make from your first set by adding two of them. And there's a theorem called the banog semeredi theorem which says if you have a set that's got rather a lot of these uh, quadruples of numbers where the difference of two is the same as the difference of another two, then it's not necessarily true that, uh, so call that set A, it's not necessarily true that A plus A is small, but what you can do is pass to a rather large so-called subset. So here the subset is B, 1, 2, 4, 6. It's a subset because I've got 1, 2, 4, 6 up here, but I haven't taken the whole lot. And when I pass down to B and look at B plus B, it's quite a lot smaller than A plus A was. In fact, the ratio of the size of B plus B to B is 9 to 4, which is just over 2, whereas the ratio of the size of A plus A to A was 20 to 6. Now, roughly speaking, the balog semeredi theorem says, if your set has this sort of structure, it's got a lot of these, uh, what I sometimes call additive quadruples, then you can find a large subset where, when you add it to itself, you don't get something too much bigger. Uh, again, I don't want to say anything about the significance of that just at the moment. Here comes problem three. This is a problem known as the Kakea problem. 